everybody talking to each other. She has a lot of people leaving to work for her. I do. Oh, I know. Recording started. Over here, too. Oh, really? Yeah. I've been around too long. Yeah. Too long. How many people are online right now? One. One. What's the person's name? Jim. Oh, yeah. Welcome, one and all. I'm Judy Baker. I'm Dean of Business Learning at Foothill College. And I thought we would go around the room since there's so few of us. If you don't mind, you'll indulge, indulge me. Just say your name and uh, where you work. When do you want to start? I'm good and ready. I'm just going to go to the college and I'm the online college faculty Oh, all right. <laughs> and we have one person online on CCC Confer. And Jim, do you want to introduce yourself? You sit chat, Jim. No, he's not doing it. Sorry. No, he's, he's probably multitasking. Yeah. Yes. I, I know that technique well. <laughs> He says, I can't speak, but I did in the chat, Evergreen, Evergreen Valley College. No, that's, that's the last one. All right. The guy did All right. Then uh, we'll have a chance to talk uh, among ourselves in, open in a few minutes. And open doors group. Sorry. Okay. Jim is on, on CC Circle, confirm. That's Open Textbooks Project. We have, to, have, to get some context for why I'm doing this project and this presentation is that I have been involved with open educational resources and open textbooks for several years now. As some of you in the audience uh, well know, is uh, I was uh, managing a, a project funded by the Hewlett Foundation for a few years to advocate and train people on the use of open educational resources and open textbooks. And I thought, well, it's been a year, a year or two since I engaged in that activity, and it's time that I walked my talk. So I begged and pleaded with my vice president at Foothill College, and I finally got permission to teach a class online. And my goal there was to teach a class using an open textbook. So that's what got me started. And having gone through that experience, I just had to share it with someone. We, we do have a new person who just entered the room. Can you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Sonali. Right. Oh, great. Yeah. I'm very excited to go to the because it's on the topic of health? Um, also, but also because it's maybe common sense. So, you know, my family should go by yours, you know. I see. So it sounds like uh, half the audience here is interested because of the open educational aspect of it, and the other half are interested because it's about health education. So we have a mixed group coming from two. Another person joined you online. Oh. Her name is Carol, and she teaches at Houston Community College Psychology. Houston Community College, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so. What I, now that you know about me, I need to know a little bit more about you. You've introduced yourself in terms of your name and where you work. How many of you are actually faculty? You're actually teaching right now. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, and how many online? Uh, one. One out of two. So almost two-thirds of the group are, are practicing teachers. That's very exciting. Of those who are practicing teachers, how many of you have actually used an open textbook or non-traditional, non-publishers proprietary? 
Have you ever taught without using a textbook? Ah, you have. And what did you use instead? Well, actually, I was teaching again the topics, and um, I could never find a book all of the topics I've done for those one time in the four year series that had all of the topics I wanted, and I don't know what happened to that series, it went away. So, actually, what I did is I put my own resources, and I had to put them together and do research to find their resources. So, if we had a topic, they would just have to go and do some research, bring it up. And uh, how would you evaluate the, the success of that course? I was really successful because I think it engaged the students in going out and looking for materials and then being able to share them with other people and because there's so much on, on the internet everywhere else, they were able to find some really great resources that we might not have seen that we just, you know, stayed in the textbook and just used that. So I thought it was successful. I pulled this thing and I did it, you know, pretty casually. I think they were pretty happy with the results. You just gave my entire presentation for me. Thank you very much. But, and I, what you just did was you, you outlined many of the advantages of, of breaking free from traditional publishers' textbooks. Is it does allow you to think of different teaching paradigms and different approaches. In this case, it's student-created content or student-identified content where they gain ownership over their entire learning process. And it, it's a very different learning experience for that student as well as for the instructor. And it's something to try. It, maybe it, it won't work for you, but give it a try and see what happens. I bet it was pretty scary when you first started. Well, yeah, maybe a little bit of a you know, feel obligated to provide this mm-hmm. like, a lot of money, and I think that right. also made them very happy. It's funny, some of the discussions that my colleagues and I have all the time is we're so, you know, so much extra for over $100. Yeah. And we don't always do every piece of it. Right. We start going down. Right, right. Well, I think that's a great segue into what we're going to talk about today is what are the differences between traditional publisher's textbooks and open textbooks, or in fact, even open educational resources. And then after that introduction, it sounds like most of you don't need an introduction to it, or, or that was a sufficient introduction. But then I wanted to share with you some of the steps I went through, uh, agonizing steps, I might uh, editorialize, uh, in the process of creating the open textbook. I didn't uh, crowdsource it with my students like you did. I wish I had. Uh, but I, I set a challenge for myself, and I followed through. So I wanted to share with you some of those steps. And then, um, of course, there's always the lessons learned. I would hope you always have a lesson learned when you experiment and take on a challenge. And then finally, I'm going to challenge all of you to collaborate either with me or with your colleagues on your own open textbook project. Sound like a plan? All right. As you know, uh, you've probably heard of uh, MIT OpenCourseWare. Anybody heard of that? Yes. Oh no, you you don't haven't heard of that? <laughs> oh, no, uh, would you care to tell us what OpenCourseWare is? Wow, give you the history. <laughs> well, MIT kind of kicked it off in 2002 with 50 courses. And then uh, around that group, the entire consortium worldwide. Um, and it's now over 250 institutions, including the community college consortium, which is the exclusive consortium of the Open Source Consortium. And it's, uh, there's, there's about 18 million courses, mm-hmm. and about 3,500 have been translated. So it's a real push to provide material online for self learners, students, educators. And what's so innovative about open courseware? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll recap. How's that? Thank you. Uh, what's so innovative about open courseware is that it breaks open that uh, classic uh, classroom door. We finally are opening up what goes on inside the classroom to the world. Prior to MIT introducing their concept of open courseware, there was something called World Lecture Hall out of the University of Texas. Anybody here old enough to remember that? No? I remember when I was teaching in 1987, I posted a
program of the uh, graduate level program evaluation course on World Lecture Hall. And it was the first effort to post uh, course syllabi on the internet. Uh, it was 87, might have been closer to 90 now that I think about it. Carol says, I have both volume and unfold, but I cannot hear anyone other than a presenter. She's just messing about it. Okay. Right. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, the, the concept's been around, but for it to take off and to uh, have em, uh, impetus and actually uh, catch on worldwide, it's taken 20 years almost. And in, yes, it, it was, no, we, you could upload the, the syllabus and post it. Yeah. But, and World Lecture Hall did exist a couple of years ago. I don't know if it still exists, because I was looking for my old syllabus and my old lessons. So uh, it's, the concept isn't so old, but the, the um, buy-in to the, the idea uh, is re fairly recent, and it's, it's taking off. Have you seen in, in the program here at the, the online teaching conference uh, over half a dozen uh, presentations on the topic of open ed and open courseware and open textbooks? So it's really a popular topic these days. So, so what are the benefits of having breaking open your classroom door, sharing your syllabus, sharing your assignments, readings, lectures, whether they're video or audio or notes, slideshows, uh, sharing um, self-assessments? What are the advantages to an institution to provide, put, post all these courses and course materials on the internet open for the whole world? What would be a major advantage to an institution? Obviously, marketing, it's good press. And it helps people who are shopping around looking for uh, what kind of education they want, not just what course to take, but where to take it. It, it. it draws a lot of traffic to your website and to your institution. And so people, and people can check out the course before they enroll. They're less likely to enroll inappropriately. They can see how much it demands and, and what it involves. The, a lot of the open courseware that's out there is fairly limited, and it, um, it's been um, vetted in the sense that if the actual course in a classroom uses copyrighted material in a classroom, you're not allowed to put um, that amount of copyrighted material online. So a lot of times you'll be looking through the open courseware and it'll say, this portion of the content is omitted due to copyright reasons. So it, it actually has some gaps in it. Uh, interestingly enough. But some other uh, reasons that I advocate for open courseware is that um, it, it is a way of fostering a, a collaborative community of knowledge sharing. It's the, the idea of letting go of intellectual property, realizing that no one wins if we hoard knowledge. We all win if we share it. So, uh, and this is one way to do it. And theoretically, it can lower the cost of learning if we crowdsource some of this information. We don't all have to start from scratch. How many times have you gone to someone else's uh, materials and then used that as a springboard to creating your own? So that just lowers the amount of time you had to spend creating your content. And probably the, the part of this that interests me the most uh, is the freedom from a textbook-centric approach to teaching. And I'm going to provide you with some evidence of this in just a minute. Again, um, there, there's a lot of terminology around open ed and open course for open textbooks. And often they are used interchangeably. And there are some groups of people who, who would argue hot and heavy over the, the nuances of definitions between them. So in some times, in order to avoid the argument, I just lump them all together, too. Uh, that's a whole side discussion to talk about the differences. But it, what I'm looking for are the general advantages and disadvantages of employing an open courseware approach, opening up your classroom to people who are not paying for it, uh, people who are not enrolled or, uh, at your institution, but opening it up. But also, what are the pros and cons of not using a traditional publisher's textbook? The most obvious one is what? What's the one that students are going to like the most? 
free. It's, well, it's nothing's really free. There are costs. It's just costs get shifted around to different people. And uh, but bottom line is it it can allow for a lower cost for that course content with some caveats. In theory, an open textbook or a digital textbook can be more current. That as soon as that uh, printed textbook comes off the press, Pluto's no longer a planet or they've discovered a new molecule or whatever it is and your book is worthless uh, or they've changed the map of the Middle East. Who knows what Syria is going to be a year from now? What, what name Syria is even going to have a year from now? Uh, much less who's ruling it. So um, the other advantage is that digital courseware that has open licensing is you don't have to run around getting permissions to uh, update it, correct it, modify it any way. It's, if you've ever tried to get permission to take someone else's material, improve it in some way, you have to beg and plead and, and get permission. It, it, you say, I wanted to improve it, but it's, it's such a hassle finding the copyright owner or getting through to the publisher to get permission. Forget it. And yet you're going to try to add value to it. So if it's open, if it's openly licensed and it's digital, you can edit it like that, make it correct, make it up to date, translate it. Uh, so there are a lot of advantages to having it openly licensed. And the, one of the f best parts is that you can get feedback and have that feedback represented in the content immediately so it's continuous improvement. It doesn't have to wait for the next edition. And it's easier to get the feedback. You can build it right into the material. So it has lots of these advantages. But as with anything else, there are disadvantages. Any of these look familiar? What's the, the biggest complaint like when we try to um, talk to faculty about use, adopting open textbooks? What do you think is the biggest complaint of the, what I have listed here? Time? No. Nope. Test banks. Would you, would you agree? Una, do you, uh, and Jackie, do you think it's test banks? Quality was one. Yes. 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 And then a lot of faculty got used to getting that publisher's um, teacher's edition, that so they could have their own physical textbook, uh, which of course added to the cost of the book. Uh, but it turns out that uh, with open textbooks are primarily digital, and getting a printed version to the student involves a lot of uh, effort on the part of maybe the, per the faculty member who adopted it because it's not the standard practice on that campus. So the bookstore doesn't have a way. You could set up a process, but somebody has to set up the process to get that printed in some way, whether it went to Lulu or on campus print press or whatever. So um, the students and the faculty can't just go through in auto mode through their regular adoption of textbooks process. So those are some of the issues you need to think about. In terms, of, so it's not always all good, and it's not all bad. So that was just to bring everybody up to speed in terms of open courseware and open textbooks. So I want to share with you the challenge I set for myself as a dean of uh, distance learning, teaching a class for the first time in 12 years. Well, you get rusty. 12 years, I'll tell you what. So. <laughs> I used to teach health education uh, 12 years at Texas Women's University, and um, the course that's offered at Foothill is called it's called Health Education. This quarter, when I'm, while I'm teaching it, the fall it's going to be called Contemporary Health Issues. But in the course outline of records, the same book, same outline, and but it's going to go from three units to four units. So this is a three-unit course currently. Um, What's driving the change to the renaming of it and the additional credits? Uh, the question in the audience is that uh, what is what drove the change at Foothill to um, for the course title and for the number of units awarded, and a, a lot of it has to do with internal politics of um, a three-unit course um, doesn't have much, carry much clout on campus in a quarter quarter system, and um, so it changes its status 
in the stack of courses to have it to have more units and um, the the term health education is a bit dated um, yes it, it counts for general education at foothill and it also transfers yes yeah. so uh, what you see here on the screen is a picture of the textbook that's used by the, the full-time faculty member who teaches it on campus um, it also happens to be the textbook I used 12 years ago at a different edition, of course. But it's the same old textbook. Um, and my, so I set this goal for myself as former manager of um, the Hewlett Project on uh, open textbooks that I'm going to use open educational resources instead of a textbook. But I also, because I work at Foothill, I have to follow the curriculum committee's out, course outline of record. Otherwise, if they won't hire me to teach again, I'll get dinged. So, meeting both of those was the challenge. Doing either one would have actually been not so bad, but trying to do both of them at the same time was quite the challenge. And I'm going to sh convince you of that in just a minute. So, how many of you um, are familiar with course outline of record? Have any of you written one? Yeah, yeah. And it's the thing with those is typically it's a committee process. And it looks like it was made by a committee. Um, and in my case, I was looking at a course outline of record that's um, a bit dated. Unfortunately, it's been updated for the fall, so that's good news. Um, I also wanted to share with you that, again, this was the textbook that's listed in our course outline of record at Foothill, and I think it's again listed for the, the one in the fall, the new one. Um, that this is a the traditional textbook and paperback it's about a hundred dollars so when i reported to our board of trustees in my annual open educational resources report that i was required to do um, i said well if you multiply my 60 students times a hundred dollars i just saved the students at put a bundle of money but you also have to look at how much time i spent create recreating this textbook or the content in the textbook as an open textbook. So we'll get to that in a minute. But does this look familiar to you, that this kind of a traditional textbook? The publisher these days, one of the reasons they're so expensive is they do provide a website with test banks, slides, packs, um, you know, terminology and glossary, uh, self-quizzing. Uh, they'll have a list of links. <laughs> uh, they have nice test banks and so on, and it'll upload directly to WebCT or whatever your course management system is, except for the one that I use, which is A2. <laughs> uh, so that's that gives you that's pretty common. Uh, this is the fourth edition, uh, and uh, we do have another health education teacher here who uses uh, another book by Hale for personal health. That was the other book listed in our course outline of records. Did it? It could be based on either this or this other book. So turns out they're pretty much the same. They're all the same. In fact, I did a study once on human, because I used to teach human sexuality, and then looked at 20 human sexuality text, textbooks, all the same. They just rearranged it slightly. Not much that's innovative. And which brings me to the point of uh, one of the other reasons I don't like using textbooks is I, I consider them to be somewhat generic, vanilla, homogenized. Why do you suppose they write them that way? Be so bland and non-controversial. Yeah. Oh. Right. They want to be a part of the pack. Yeah. It's it's a marketing issue. Is that um, if you make your book too unique, then you won't have as many colleges or universities adopting your book. It becomes a, a whole meme, actually, is that there's almost an expectation by the faculty that it's going to look just like every other personal health textbook. So but what happens, and it can't be regional. It can't make reference to any regional issues um, or colloquialisms um, or slang um, or, or regional landmarks. It becomes so bland and boring. So that's one issue uh, to consider. So um, 
the what are some of the advantages to using a publisher's textbook? The quality control has been vetted and peer reviewed. Have any of you ever reviewed a textbook? Oh, you have. Okay. And did you get paid for that? Yeah. 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 Okay. I, I've also reviewed textbooks. Uh, turns out that um, the vetting of textbooks isn't actually as rigorous as they might lead you to believe. And it turns out that many of these textbooks, particularly the test banks and the ancillary materials, that are fraught with error. Um, what? It's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to. It's an author. Someone, they hire someone to make a test bank. Yeah. Not the same author, right. Obviously, facts are wrong. Yes. So um, a lot of it is the hype and the marketing that makes it. And it is slick when you look at the textbook. It passes the flip test. It looks nice when you flip through it. But then if you actually have to cheat with it and write a, a test based on it, it's a whole other issue. Um, so uh, what are some other advantages? It has been edited to death by professional editors, not, you know, primarily journal former journalists who can't get jobs now. But <laughs> basically it has the same voice throughout. And that's a huge advantage. Yes? Yes. So the the using a publisher traditional publisher's textbook has an advantage because they do have huge budgets and huge staff who are specialized in creating rich multimedia. So they can create all that that we couldn't possibly do in our uh, in our spare time on the weekends that we're asked to do this. So that's certainly an advantage. Uh, it, it's also with traditional publishers textbook, it has an ISBN attached to it. You can buy it anywhere on Amazon now. And in fact, I discovered textbooks for sale on the bulletin board. So, um, and I've even seen open, free open textbooks sold on, being sold on Craigslist in the Bay Area. The, the collaborative statistics book. I see it trying to be sold all the time when it's free. Yes, Jackie. Well, certainly doesn't apply to you, but sometimes a good textbook can find some paper Ah, yes. At least we could salvage this because we had a textbook. Yes, sad to say. All right, but again, they they are costly. They do get out of date fairly fast. They um, my big concern is for that poor teacher. It almost promotes teaching to the textbook. It's almost like what I call it is junk food or fast food of teaching. Sometimes. You get that semester in that quarter when you just have too much going on and it's so easy just to use everything the publisher has and teach from them and not put any of your personality or any effort into it and you just go through the motion. It's a lot like going to McDonald's when you've had a long day. You know it's not good for you, but it, it, nourish, it got you through from the hunger pains, but you're going to pay for it down the road. You're going to be sorry later on that night that you succumb to the McDonald's. So here we go. So what I found out as I embarked on this challenge was that the course, I looked up the course outline and record for this course, and lo and behold, you see on the left-hand side, 14 topics. And then I looked over at the table of contents of the personal health textbook. My goodness. So do you think that Pearson or whoever copied our course outline of record to create their textbook? So once again, it's become for public, it's textbook-centric curriculum development. That's scary. And in fact, if you if I showed you the entire course outline of record, you you would swear it was pulled straight from the textbook. And I purposely didn't look up the textbook until after I was done creating the course. So I did. I didn't want to be biased by it. I went by this this list on the left-hand side because I'm an adjunct teaching this 
outside of my dean job. I want to follow orders. I'm supposed to teach from the course outline record. I ended up teaching from the textbook, didn't I? It unknowingly, I did something that I can't, I don't even believe in. Yes. But do we want journalists? By and large, these textbooks are are the rough draft is originally written by someone who's maybe taught that course on their own for a while. But by and large, the textbook is written by a lot of English majors, journalists, editors. Um, who do a bang up job and write a good book, but they aren't educators for the most part. What what little pedagogy was in there gets washed out quite a bit. But the, my concern is that who who is the tail wagging the dog here? Is, is it, do we want the textbook publishing industry to tell us how to teach personal health? No, uh, and it, it's these two authors then who are telling us how to teach personal health. But then if you look at the, all the 20 personal health textbooks that are out there, they all start looking alike. There might be some, we get locked into this. It's so, you're right, you're busy, you're an adjunct, you have to teach it next week. You have to do what you have to do. I understand that. But And we get sucked into this pattern of teaching from the textbook. So. Um, now what you see on the left-hand side is, again, the course outline of record that I was, I'm obligated to follow. Now on the right-hand side, I ended up with these 11, because we have 11 weeks and a quarter at Foothill, so I put the 14 topics on the course outline of record into 11 weeks. And I pretty much followed, yeah, I, I, that's what I followed. So then if you compare it with the textbook, I pretty much followed that textbook. So when when I and one student in the first week of class said, "Wasn't well, there a textbook for this class?" and I said, "Well, you can go buy the one that's used in the on campus classroom. I bet it's closed, and I'm sure. It w but I purposely wasn't looking at it, but I, I suspected that it was. So, all right. So the steps to uh, just to scare you a little bit. These are all the steps it takes to create uh, open educational resources for health education textbook. So basically. As I said before, I started out with the, the course outline of record, and then I, so that took how long just to go over that issue. But no, step two was to find the sources, and actually that, finding the sources was a lot, was the easiest part, I think. Because looking at the course outline of per record was depressing. But finding the, the sources was fun. Then step number three was review the open educational resources to identify errors, omissions, inaccuracies, biases, uh, redundancies, typos. You'd be surprised what's out there. That probably ended up taking, of all of the ten steps, the most amount of time was vetting the information. So, uh, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. I am going to talk about exactly where I got that. So after looking at it and finding it, then I had to really decide what of all of this wealth of information was I going to use. There I was starting to be a real teacher, filter the information. Then um, these sources of uh, content for the health course all had various uh, open licenses. So I had to double check and make sure and, and keep track of which one had which kind of license and follow the rules of each license. That was time consuming, keeping because they all have different constraints. Then I had to organize it all. Then the next most time consuming was to come up with assignments, discussion questions, test tanks, um, these little pictures to go with things, make it all accessible. Um, then the, this quarter has been basically the pilot test. And what I did with my class this quarter is every week, after they take the quiz, they have to take a weekly quiz on the content. Um, they also had a chance to evaluate the module, and so every week I get feedback about that module, and I go back and I revise based on the immediate feedback for because I'm sharing this course content with a person who's teaching it. Actually, she started Monday. She's using it now, so uh, she got 
the benefit of the feedback I got from the pilot test of my students this spring. And then, um, I, and I get, I let her have the content. I wouldn't give it to her anyway, but I said, on the condition that you give me feedback on the, the test bank and everything else and help me improve it, I wouldn't give it to her anyway. But I said, oh, you have to do this now. And then finally, what I'm going to uh, challenge you at the end is, um, by fall, I think I'll be ready to share this with the world, but actually I'm going to share it with you now, because you've been so attentive. Uh, Una asked where, what the source of the content for the course is. What I did was, if you look in the upper left-hand corner, I went to Google, and I typed in health site colon period dot gov, and look what I got. All kinds of free, totally open, public domain content, pictures, photos, activities, a lot of great material. That was the problem. It was too much. It was a whole lot of stuff. But fortunately, having taught the course for 12 years, having a PhD in health ed, it, um, I could vet this, but maybe your average person who only teaches us once every five years would, might find that pretty daunting. I could glance and pretty much tell the quality. It turns out the government p does post material that's out of date and inaccurate and somewhat biased. Um, if you've ever taught human sexuality in Texas or anywhere in the vital belt or during the Republican administration in the White House, you know that a lot of the material that's provided to the public about human sexuality um, has an emphasis on abstinence and not so much on birth control methods. I had, I had a hard time finding good quality material on birth control methods. I, was, I thought we, you know, we were away from the Republican administration. I thought we could get back. No, it's it's lingering. So, and it turns out that um, what goes on these government websites really is dictated by politics. I mean, and it is whitewashed in a sense. Bill was very biased and. Even like something like diabetes and um, some of the multicultural health issues were very, a lot more biased than I expected. Yes. So you think that I know you're taking the time yourself to find all of these things, mm -hmm. but instead you think maybe the students should be asked to find Yes. Them? That's well. We're getting to my lessons where you just stole my punchline. Oh, sorry. So um, a lot of legwork, and maybe you should. Andrea and the audience suggested that we ha let, let the students um, generate the, the content themselves or find the content themselves, which of course is stealing my lessons learned. No, I'm just like, but, it's fine. <laughs> why didn't you Why didn't you tell me that six months ago when I was working on this? So I didn't, and I didn't rely totally on a Google search. That was actually where I started. Because actually, I started looking at a few of the repositories. Very few of them have health education as open textbooks or open information. I, I was shocked. There's not a given open textbook for health education that's appropriate. Um, a lot of them are very medical oriented or they're trying to sell pharmaceuticals or something. So, um, uh, so I tried the government sites. So between the Centers of Disease Control and National Institutes for Health, it you know, pretty much covers most of what you need for personal health. But then um, TED uh, lectures, video lectures, which are captioned, um, also had some health ones. And now there's something called TEDx. But um, they, they aren't as advanced. As, they don't have as much in the way of health. But just TED itself was a great source. And then probably the, the other largest source of content was the Open, Open University in um, Britain. If you check that one out, it's great. But what I was looking for was content that was had a nice, clean, clear, crisp identification of the open license and what kind of an open license it was. So I've kept track of which kind of license it is as I pull together the content. So I did go to some of these sources as well, but the vast majority of it was the U.S. government, which all of you paid for. Thank you very much. So. Um, and then again, most of the pictures I got were from Centers for Disease Control NIH sites, but um, there were a few I still needed. And if you don't know how to use Google Advanced Images Search, then I suggest you do that whenever you have to do a PowerPoint presentation. Whoops. And you look at 
the usage rights. It's very hard to find a get to the advanced image search area in Google. They've made it much harder for some reason. It's really tricky. Yeah, it's very tricky. But once you get there, you basically have to start from an image and go backwards. That's how I do it. So um, rather than a regular search. So, uh, but eventually you have to get down to this part, usage rights, flip this down, and then pick free to use or share. Or share. Otherwise, you're, you go to um, more files. More files dot com is it or four? Yeah. Anyway, so those are the main ones. But I mostly did the U.S. government. So to move on. The other big issue, of course, is the I pulled all this stuff together. How was I going to disseminate it? And I wasn't happy with it being a final version, so I didn't create a printed version available to buy through Lulu or one of these do-it-yourself print shops. Well, I could have. I probably would in the future, but it's not ready. That's why I put Lulu down here as a, a way to print it. There's a lot of these, not a lot, there's a few of these places that will print for you and then the students can go buy it. Yeah. They could if they wanted to. What I did was I, I posted the entire content inside my course management system and I provided, the, you can print from the course management system but it, it wastes paper and has so much space in it. Um, so I created accessible PDF versions and accessible Word versions of the content and they, they could print out by module, by chapter. I didn't call them chapters, they're modules. So, um, but what I didn't have basically is I didn't, there was no way for them to get it from the bookstore. Uh, basically they had to print it out themselves and I hope they weren't going to the library and printing it out because it, it probably ends up to be about 350 pages. Just, you know. So that's an issue. So what I did uh, yesterday, I sent out a poll to my students. We still final exams are next week, I think, or the week after. Um, I sent out a poll, and I want you to guess how many of the students I asked them, do you prefer to have um, a required textbook, you know, publisher's textbook, no textbook, optional textbook, or you don't know, care? And what do you think the results were? How many of them do you think likes not having a textbook for the course? What do you think? I I was surprised by the results. Only 10% said that um, they would have preferred something else. They would have preferred a required textbook. 90% were okay with not having a textbook and just. But you still have some things that you have. Yeah, yeah. If they wanted to print it out, yeah. But uh, so, and then I think that's changed because a couple of years ago when we did these kind of surveys, a lot more said, oh, we've got to have a print version. You know, we've got to have that traditional one that we can buy. So there, uh, I think at e each year this, this, this is going to change. That was interesting. How do you assess your students? How do I, uh, in the course management system? Yeah, they take a weekly quiz, they do weekly discussions. They take a midterm and a final, but they had the option of instead of the, the midterm and final, they could do a, a project, either uh, you know, take action project of um, personal, either adopt someone to help with a personal health issue or their themselves, or their neighborhood or their workplace. Uh, yeah, essay and multiple choice, which which is if you know me, that's not at all how I teach, but it's 60 students and. I didn't, I didn't know, I've never taught 60 students. I've either taught 200 or I've taught my usual 35. I didn't, wasn't sure how to handle 60. So some of this was a learning curve for me. All right, so lessons learned. We're, we're wrapping this up here. Uh, is that they still do want the convenience, the familiarity of the printed textbook because it's convenient. It's what you're used to. It's familiar. Um, that first couple of weeks, they just, well, where's the textbook? Where, where do I buy it? And, and well, why can't we just have a text? And then after the first, second week, they stop on that. And they apparently, since I told them yesterday, they changed their mind on that one. So uh, the, other, the other big lessons learned were I spent an awful lot of time verifying whether the U.S. government information was correct and accurate. Uh, and sometimes it would contradict, you go to NIH and you go to 
Centers for Disease Control on the same topic and the, like how to treat diabetes or something. They get opposite information, so then I had to find another source, and then I had to edit and correct it a lot. Formatting was incredible, especially making it accessible. And then uh, because it came in all when I copy pasted it from the site in all different formats, I spent a lot of time on that. Yes. Did you have to consider even formatting it for Kindle and uh, things like that? Is that something that yeah. you have to Yeah. Well, I, I've had it in a, as a web page in the course management system, which pretty much, if it's HTML, it works on almost anything. But then they could also just download the PDF, which I had made accessible starting with the Word document. So the issue of um, what what kind of platform the end user, the the student is using, is, is something to consider. Yeah, PDFs, we found that PDFs, some PDFs do not display properly on Safari browsers. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
on principle. So, yes. Uh -huh. I wonder, who is trying to do it? Sometimes I think, well, it's students, because students will tell instructors, hey, put your syllabus on black. Yes. Put this information. Yes. I'm going to read it on my mobile phone. But many times, we'll go to, oh, I don't know, like OTC 12, and we'll hear about new technologies. And we'll say, oh, man, I not used those people. I just did that. Voice thread. Uh, and we can listen to some of these things. That we go back and we get our students to use or inflict on our students mm -hmm. or test out stuff that we think our, our students. Sometimes it's a great match. Yes. Yeah. Because we're excited about mm -hmm. it. We say, yes, this is a great technology. But other times it's like, Right. Yes. Yes. The, let me repeat this for the audience that can't hear you uh, online. Is the question in the audience was uh, from a philosophy teacher? Was that who's driving these innovations? Is it the uh, students who are demanding it, and which is the case, or is it the fact that you see some shiny new object and and got to have it? Uh, and who are we really serving in either case? Are we really, shouldn't pedagogy and, and uh, scientifically based research on learning, teaching and learning, shouldn't that be driving what, app, what technology we use? Uh, I'm embellishing a little bit on what you said, but I think you make a really important point that we don't, I don't use wiki pages for the sake of you, just because I love wiki pages. In fact, I can't stand the kind of I'm going to format the thing. That's why when you go there, I haven't done the formatting on it. I just copy paste it from my web pages and try to put it in there. It's it's not fun to make a wiki page accessible at all. So, um, but you're right. In chasing the 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 shiny objects, I don't think serves anyone. You have a teaching problem or a learning problem, then you go out and find a shiny object that will help you solve the problem. That would obviously be the better approach. But sometimes innovation comes, arrives in unique ways. And sometimes we do need those early adopters who are doing it just because it's, it's fun or different or exciting and they get that adrenaline rush out of it. Sometimes we do need that. But as I said from the very beginning was, is, are we going to let the textbook publishers drive or the shiny object drive how we teach? Or are we going to take ownership of our teaching back again? And I would contend that open courseware and open textbooks is a way for us to do that, although in my case it ended up backfiring. So I have to be perfectly honest with you. And it's, I'm, it's a, very embarrassing to do that, but I have to be honest. Yes? Well, I was wondering about the curriculum actually we have to go through the and if you actually create your textbook, there is that representative textbook. Yes. I'm on the Yes. So all about that. And I'm wondering um, what do you think? Do you think there's going to be any uh, questioning about that? Or even the representative text? But now, how, if we start to do this, how do we now say this is our representative? Okay, let me repeat this for the audience online. The question is a question that comes up co often when we do our dog and pony show about open textbooks, is that uh, how can we be sure that once we've done all this work to create an open textbook, that the curriculum committees and then the articulation agreements and transfer of your course to another university, that all of this will be kosher, it will be acceptable. And actually we, we um, worked with a faculty member who did spend some time investigating, not just in California, but in other states, it, was this a problem in terms of articulation? And the word we got was that with the articulation officers was that it's not really a problem as long as the course outline ha says a representative textbook and the content you provide matches that representative textbook. Um, it doesn't have to be literal, and it wasn't the big issue that we initially thought it was going to be when we first started. That was a big concern, and it turns out it, articulation officers just 
thought, no big deal. We thought they were going to make a huge deal out of it. So that was a good question. Jackie, did you want to add to that? Or? Yeah, I mean, there has to be, like, I felt like you're one of the more of an indictment of the status of sports curriculum. Yeah. Right, right. The problem with that we are, you know. Right. But there must be some reason, and I can imagine, one of the reasons for having a standard number of things you need to learn in Chem 1 is because when that student goes to Chem 2, that professor doesn't want to have to do remedial on Chem 1. Right. Right. So there's... Guess what's the alternative to having a standard course outline? Well, my issue was that the outline was based on a textbook instead of the textbook was picked to match what the faculty considered pedagogically important or for the career in health education or whatever. That was more my issue was I'm happy to follow course outline or record so that whoever you transfer to knows what was taught in the class. And as we know, every, you can have 20 sections of Psychology 101, and it will be taught 20 different ways, regardless of they're all using the same course outline or record. But my issue was that that course outline or record was based on a textbook instead of the other way around. That, that was, which, which I didn't realize until I was done. So but the way I, the strategy I chose, which maybe was bad strategy. Thank you for sharing that. Any other questions? Any questions from our Hawkins? Anybody left? Did you have Shim's probably still in? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, any other questions? These are great questions. Good insight. This is a great case study. Those who would like to do this and yeah. maybe they can go through some of those. I would have. Uh, so, is anybody going to take me up on this and actually log in and work on it? Or, you could post your your lecture notes on a wiki and crowdsource editing the course content so that you aren't all on your own. Be surprised. There's all kinds of people out there who might want to help. Graduate students, if I need the experience. So if, if you do uh, want to talk some more about this or collaborate on my revisions for the fall course, um, feel free to contact me, and thank you for your attention today. Thank you. Judy, what about students who want